We're going to begin today with the latest on the corona pandemic and efforts to slow down the spread of the virus here in the United States. The number of confirmed COVID-19 in the U.S. is now well above 20,000 with hot spots of infection on both coasts. Given that, we'll spend the rest of the program on some issues you might have, like how to manage finances and cooking and things like that. But let's start with the latest White House briefing. Today, President Trump and his coronavirus task force addressed the issue of testing capacity, as well as other steps the administration is taking. NPR science correspondent Joe Palka listened in, and he is with us now to tell us more. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Glad to be here. Okay, first, start with what's the availability of test kits for the virus now? Well, clearly, the, te the test kits are becoming more available. Assistant Secretary of Health Admiral Brent Jirwas says there are 91 public health labs capable of performing the test. And all the major clinical industrial testing labs are offering tests as well. So there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people in this country who've gotten tested. Over 195,000 people in America have completed their testing. That means test plus results. This does not count the people whose tests are in process. But there was also made it clear that tests should go to people who need them most. Those seriously ill, also workers who may have symptoms, or people in long-term care facilities who may be. We've been hearing reports that hospitals are running low on masks and gowns and other equipment needed to protect healthcare workers. Did anybody at the briefing address that? Yes, uh, there was a definitely discussion about how the situation was poor, but it was getting better. And the head of FEMA was saying that supplies were available and, and they were matching need with supply. Although at one point, Vice President Pence said, if you have spare masks sitting in your storeroom, take them to the local hospital. So clearly it's not all sorted out. So earlier today, the president tweeted that he was very positive about a treatment for the virus that involved two drugs, one an antibiotic and the other a malaria medication. Did that come up? Yes, so the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Anthony Fauci, addressed that. He said there are some, there's some anecdotal evidence for that cocktail, but he said it wasn't proven. And he said there are basically two groups who give advice about drugs people should consider taking. One is people who want to give patients some hope that they can cling to if they have a dangerous disease. And then you have the other group, which is my job as a scientist, to say my job is to ultimately prove without a doubt that a drug is not only safe, but that it actually works. So Fauci was saying for right now, there's no proof that it works. And briefly, if you can, did Dr. Fauci give an indication about how well he thinks he does his efforts? to combat all of this were actually working? Well, he thinks there is some uh, measurable difference and, and improvement, but how much and how fast and how far up in the air. That is NPR science correspondent Joe Pong. Thank you. You're welcome. We're gonna spend some time now looking at the issue of testing and why it's been so hard to get as many tests as needed to medical professionals and the public. In a recent article titled, What Are Testing in the US? And he's with us now. We're there, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So did I frame this correctly just to start with? Is that the core of the issue, that there just aren't as many tests as needed for the public? Uh, yes, it's certainly one of the major problems, but it's probably worth clarifying what, what the point of the testing was in this early phase. So in the early days of the epidemic, there was never an expectation really among any public health authorities that everyone would be able to get a test. That's not how the system is designed. What we want in those early parts of the epidemic is really to be able to do what's called disease surveillance, where you're tracking the spread and the rate of spread of the disease. Then you're using tools like contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine to really out and if you can stop the disease before it gets to the levels that we're seeing now. So you explained that the first misstep started with the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. What happened? So, you know, basically what happened was very early on, the CDC, along with a number of other groups around the world, was able to develop a working test for what we now call COVID-19. What happened though was on February 5th, the CDC sent out about a little more than 50 kits to a group of public health laboratories. And when the public health labs tried to verify these kits, they found that they were getting inconclusive results. And so the test was not working the way it was supposed to. So first of all, there was this three-week delay because the CDC didn't get working test kits into the hands of public health labs, and that just came at exactly the wrong time. Is that is that about right? That's correct. Yeah, one way to think about it is that there's sort of three phases of testing. So in the very earliest, earliest phases, the CDC alone is doing tests. And one thing to say is that the test the CDC developed, as far as we know, has always worked at the CDC. But they have a very small capacity for testing relative to what we need. 
The second phase was the phase done by the public health laboratory. And then the third phase of testing is the phase that we're in now, where large commercial manufacturers are producing tests in the tens of hundreds of thousands and even millions. And that's the phase where you can start to think about, okay, maybe we'll try to get testing for everybody. I think a question that a lot of people would have is, given what we know now uh, about our systems for getting tests created and disseminated, is there something that should be changed? Yes, I mean, certainly there are a number of things that should be changed. One of the biggest things that will have to change, I think, is rethinking a system that really depended on the CDC to get things right. So Keith Jerome, head of the University of Washington Virology Lab, said that the dependence on the really created what he called an agriculture monoculture. So essentially we're depending on one single point to get it right. And the CDC, to its credit, had been so good in past epidemics that everybody just sort of trusted that that would work. It was never seen that this might be a point of failure. But now we've learned that that in fact can fail. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that when a new epidemic comes along, we're not relying on the CDC as good as it is and as good as it can be to provide our only source of testing. We need to make sure that there are the right things possible. Just to sum it up, so Robert, yes, there were some logistical failures that could have worked better, but part of it is the uncertainty and people not managing people's expectations correctly. People are told they should probably get a test. They don't really know what to do. And if they can't get a test, then they panic. That's absolutely the case, yes. I mean, when they get a test, it really sends the wrong message to the American people, especially at a time when the system was not capable of providing those tests. Um, you know, right now, public health authorities are really telling people, don't go get a test unless you really, really need one. And that means that you've been told by your healthcare provider to go seek a test. But the test would have been helpful, right, in figuring out the course of this thing, wouldn't it? I mean... They absolutely would have, but let's think about who they'd be helpful for. So at an individual level, you know, if I think that I'm sick, I might think that it's helpful for me to know whether or not I need a test. But really at the phase where the problems emerge that we're talking about, those tests are mostly helpful for epidemiologists and other public health officials to see the spread of the disease. They need to use that testing capacity to be able to monitor the country and figure out where do we have hot spots, where do we have people who might have been exposed to the disease, people who we need to ask to quarantine themselves. That's Robert P. Barrett. He's a contributing writer for many publications, including The New Yorker. We're talking about a piece that he wrote titled, What Went Wrong with Coronavirus Testing in the U.S.? Robert Barrett, thanks so much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. We're going to head to China now, which now has more new coronavirus cases from travelers entering the country than through local infection. Major Chinese cities are making anyone arriving from abroad isolate for two weeks. And as NPR's Emily Fang reports, one group is now caught up by these restrictions, Chinese students studying abroad. Do I stay or do I go? The choice now faced by the more than 660,000 Chinese students overseas, according to China's education ministry. So Minzhou, Miami University, decided to take a risk and come back home, flying back into Beijing early in mid-March. I voluntarily told them that I had a problem. You can't cover up something like this. You have As cases drop, but potentially are bringing the virus with them. There are now more imported cases of the virus in China than those transmitted domestically. So major Chinese cities, including Beijing and Shanghai, now mandate that everyone, including foreigners entering China, quarantine at a central location, usually a hotel, with the visitor paying the cost. Film is now shut into a Beijing hotel, paying a little less than 10 years If I have the virus and stayed in the US, I'd just be waiting to die. The China would treat to this more satisfactory. The situation has flipped. In January, residents left China in droves as the outbreak overwhelmed local healthcare systems. Now, China is one of the few countries with its outbreak under control. So people are flying back to China where they say they feel safer. So many people, in fact, that Sao Pangsheng, a former treatment facility built during the SARS outbreak and reopened during the COVID-19 outbreak, is being retooled yet again, this time to hold travelers entering Beijing from abroad. The Beijing Health Commission has told students abroad not to come back. Those ways have their own risks. William Chang is a junior at Duke University. He's wrestling with whether to return home to Jiangsu province or stay at Duke. 
He says students like him are worried less about the two-week hotel quarantine in China and more about the uncertainty of resuming their studies. When we go back to the United States, the United States may have like a different policy, maybe from the law of the Chinese system to go back. Raymond Sun is a junior at Harvard University. He's now into his third quarantine. First after a vacation to Tokyo, a second after returning to Harvard, and a third two-week isolation period when he returned to Beijing in early March. He was taken off the plane to a central processing facility, he sent by officials in hazmat suits, and put on a special bus to go into quarantine. So essentially, it's a closed circle, meaning that you didn't render off into other streets or something. Raymond is lucky. He flew in right before the hotel quarantine policy began, so he's isolated at home. But he says he'd do a hotel quarantine if that's what was required of him. More people from China or from across the world are more affected by this outbreak than my life. So, like many Chinese people, Song feels the inconveniences of quarantines, however invasive, are worth it, as long as they help other people. Emily Feng and Pierre News, Beijing. We're focusing this hour on answering practical questions about the coronavirus and all the changes to daily life it's brought about. In a minute, we hear about how to juggle dating and social distancing. But first, we're going to turn our attention to personal finances. It's probably safe to assume that the steps being taken to control the coronavirus outbreak is affecting your finances. On the one hand, you might be saving on your commute. On the other, you might be spending more, stocking up on food and cleaning supplies or books and games and activity sets for the kids. And a lot of people are making less money or seeing income dry up completely because so many workplaces have shut down. That got us wondering about what we should be doing with our money during this time. So we've called Kimberly Palmer. She is a writer at Nerd Wallet. That's a site dedicated to giving financial advice. And she's going to give us some money management tips. Kimberly Palmer, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I, I think it's accurate to say that a lot of people are nervous right now, and that seems to be leading to some panic buying at the grocery store or the drugstore. Do you have some advice on what people should try to keep in mind as they stock up for self-isolation? It can be a good idea to buy groceries to help you last through any time period you have to spend in your house, which for a lot of people is a week or more. So we are buying more than we're used to, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does put a strain on a lot of people's budgets in the short term. And so this is what really underscores why it's so important to have an emergency savings fund so we can cover situations like that when we see our expenses. Uh, but there's no need to go to the extent that we've seen uh, with people overbuying things like toilet paper, paper products, uh, canned goods that could last for months. And so you definitely want to apply a sense that you really don't need all the food you could imagine for the next six months. Well, you talked about the importance of an emergency fund, but the Labor Department reported a jump of 70,000 new claims for unemployment since last week. I'm just going to assume that some of these folks don't have an emergency fund. So is there something that people who find their income suddenly cut off could be doing right now? Yes. In a lot of cases, people have to very quickly prioritize which bills they're going to pay this month. In some cases, it's just not possible to pay all of them. And so if you can't make your credit card payment, for example, call your credit card issuer and see if they can give you more time, if they can waive interest. Because of the situation right now, some companies are proactively making those kinds of offers to consumers. So you have to call and ask. Uh, so that can be a first step. It can give you a little bit more time uh, to get you that help. And then also, in some cases, uh, it, some people, if you have good credit, uh, you can use your credit card to uh, make purchases. You still want to be sure to make your minimum payments every month so you can protect your credit score. Uh, but that can give you a little leeway if you have that option, if you have a credit card that you can use. Kimberly, are there any specific changes you're making right now? Yes, we have three kids, and so we are naturally cutting back in areas like kids' activities. We usually are spending a lot right now on sports for springtime, dance classes for my daughter, so we're cutting back because we have to. Those have been canceled. So all of that spending that we used to do, we are now putting it into savings because it just helps give us a little bit more buffer since there's so much uncertainty right now. And what I think I hear you say, about it is it just so do you do you have a specific method for this i mean do you have like a specific budget for restaurants or do you say to yourself oh i would be ordering out you know friday night uh takeout but instead i'm going to transfer this amount to my savings like do you have some system 
for keeping track of what you're actually saving. We use the 50, 30, 20 budget. So basically 50 percent we dedicate to needs. So that's like our mortgage and groceries. 30% is wants and that's the restaurant spending or ordering takeout. And then 20% is uh, debt payments and savings. But it's that 30% that's changing right now. And so where we used to have that restaurant spending, personal care spending, uh, getting haircuts and activities for my kids, that's what we can now transfer into savings because there's so much uncertainty. We want to build up our emergency savings like so many people. That was Kimberly Palmer. She's a personal finance writer at Nerd Wallet. Kimberly Palmer, thank you so much for joining us and good luck to you too. Thank you. Another part of many people's lives is facing adjustment dating, especially with social distancing becoming so important as a way to prevent the spread of illness. So what's the best way to start or keep a relationship going while trying to stay healthy? Do you even try to date at a time like this? To talk about this, we reached out to two people we like to check in with to talk about such matters. Stephen Petro is a USA Today columnist who writes about manners, among other things. And Lisa Bonos writes about dating and relationships for the Washington Post. Thank you all so much for joining us at a distance. I have to say, Hardy, fist bump to you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Hi, Michelle. All right, Stephen, I'll start with you. You're a very social person. I think you've made that clear. How are you coping with social distancing in your relationships? Well, as, uh, as people know, I am a rich with work, so I'm out there on, on the market, and um, I took a pause, but I have just um, sort of picked up things and had a date this afternoon. It's a walking date around the lake, six okay. feet apart, and I'm fine. We're, we're fine. And what, what about the whole, one of the things I said, I mentioned you write about manners a lot. When you first greet someone, you know, it is such a natural thing in American life to handshake, sometimes even hug. What are you suggesting? And what are you suggesting if somebody kind of goes in for the hug, even if you're not feeling that? You shouldn't be feeling that. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear with people that we want to do that namaste bow, which is putting your hands together in front of your heart and sort of making a, a little bow. And that will stop people in their tracks and say, oh, you don't want to shake my hand and uh, you want to keep your distance. And I think that's kind of a humorous way to um, make clear that we need to sort of abide by these new rules. And just briefly before I go to Lisa, how did you set up the date? Had you already been talking to the person? Yes, um, on an app, on one of those dating apps. And we actually kind of set the rules ahead of time that we both believed in social distancing. And I'll say the big plus was, you know, often at the end of the date, you don't know whether to shake hands, give a kiss or whatever. Well, that was easy. You <laughs> took it about and went off. You took it off the table. All right, Lisa, what about yeah. you? I mean, it's, I mean, doesn't sound that romantic. I have to be honest. So at a time when we're still quarantining and what, what, what are you hearing and what are your contacts saying? What do you think about this? Yeah. So I've spoken to several relationship experts who are talking about FaceTime and Skype dates and kind of how to make those fun. You can set yourself up. You know, if you're a writer, you can set your your camera up in front of your bookshelf, or if you're a musician, you can sit in front of your record collection. And they really talked about still making it seem special, putting on a nice shirt. You don't have to wear pants, <laughs> but um, you know, drinking out of a nice glass, not um, you know, acting as if you were hosting someone in your home because you virtually are. Are are, these are, 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 are do you find that people are in fact observing things? Rules. Have the attitudes changed? Because you know we've all seen the pictures from the beaches in Florida, the young, you know, young kids. You know, I'm sorry, I'm showing my age right here. The kids, you know, partying. But have you observed attitudes changing? I have. Um, I spoke to one woman in London who went on her first FaceTime date, and it sort of happened by accident. She had met someone at a bar a couple weeks ago, so the bars are still open in. in in Britain, but they had met at a bar a couple weeks ago, and um, they're text they're texting on WhatsApp, and she said something about how she was really craving wine, but she knows it's not good to drink alone. Pretty soon, the man she'd been texting with sent her 15 pounds and said, "Like, I'll buy the wine. Let's Facetime at eight. And they spent several hours together talking, and ended up getting the same bottle of wine for each of them, so they could have similar experiences. And and listen, you were saying that. Like Stephen just mentioned at, at the end of his um, walking date, that that it kind of took off the table the pressure for, if I could just be blunt about it, took off the pressure for, for other kinds of intimacy, right, from the first date. It, it, it reimposed a new norm. Would, it, would you think that that's accurate? 
Oh, for sure. Uh, dating experts talk about how you know it takes that gamesmanship off the table of are you you know is this person coming home with me tonight? <laughs> it's not an option now, so it's really a chance to connect um, emotionally. I think physical. Steve, instead of moving to a kind of a more serious note here, you call this the new mm -hmm. normal. But you've also likened it to another time when a crisis, health crisis, created new norms for social behavior. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I wrote a column in USA Today last week, which which looked back at to prevent pregnancy. And um, as a public health person at that time, commons were a must, including humor, which is some of what we're talking about today. I remember putting a condom over my head, blowing it up so people could see. Yes. Yeah, you know, it can get really big and it's really strong. And uh, so that kind of like right humor as a way to model behavior, it was very effective, um, especially in a time of crisis. So, you know, we need to use all of our strategies now to maintain intimacy, you know, and to, um, you know, social distancing seems like not the right term. I think we're talking about physical um, distance, but we still want to find ways to be intimate and use our technologies. And, and the same question I had asked Lisa earlier: Are you observing that in the in your contacts, the people you speak with, your circle, these norms being observed? Do you find the attitude change uh, taking place? You know, I wrote with humor last week, and this week I am going to be writing with anger. You know, I am not seeing fast enough change. When we see that curve of growth of cases and deaths, it's um, it's just it's just frightening beyond belief. People need to hear this message. Stay six feet apart. Stay home when you're told to. And, and so, um, this may or may not be on the more you personal, but what about the, the X factor, as in people who are tempted to text their X or X's because, you know, people have some time on their hands, they're thinking about them, and perhaps they feel that somebody that they already know might be, I don't know what's the word to use here. You know, safer than somebody who they've never met. What What are you hearing about that? And do you have any advice about that? Yeah, I spoke to a psychologist who said that it makes sense that in times of crisis we think of or reach toward the person that we last felt safe with, but not in every relationship ends well. So experts told me, you know, to think about how a relationship ended before you reach out to the person, but and to be okay with. You know, you might reach out, and if and that person might not respond. And so, if you're okay with kind of saying, checking in, and asking how someone is doing, and knowing that you may not hear from them, then go ahead and, and do it. And also, final thought from you: um, you doing anything interesting to try to get through this time? Um, I have been talking to my parents every day on the phone, and friend on the phone uh, and not necessarily sometimes it's a close friend but it could be somebody I haven't talked to in months and tonight I do have a FaceTime date with an ex of mine so oh, Stephen you have any any advice for Lisa here <laughs> well yeah I know Lisa well she is an expert in all things dating so I'm sure that uh Lucky. All right, we'll keep us both posted. Lisa Bonas writes about dating and relationships for the Washington Post. Stephen Petra is a columnist for the USA Today. Thank you both so much. Thanks for Whether self-isolating solo with roommates or with family, these are stressful times for all of us, and we know music can help bring some relief. That's why last week we asked you to let us know what songs you turn to to help keep anxiety at bay. And this weekend we're playing some of your suggestions. First up, a track recommended by someone who goes by the Twitter handle at Swing the Blues. The song is called Go Bang by British musician and producer Subtract. That was Go Bang by the artist Subtract. You can still add to our special anti-anxiety playlist. If you've got a song that helps you relieve stress, tell us about it. Just tweet us at NPRATC and use the hashtag NoStressPlaylist. And we will hear more of your music picks tomorrow.
While many people are sheltering in place to protect themselves and others from the coronavirus, some people don't seem all that worried. These differences in behavior and attitude have a lot to do with how people perceive their risk of getting sick. And here's Patty Naiman has this report. Everybody should be taking this crisis seriously, says Dr. Tom Frieden, former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is an unprecedented event. Nothing that any of us can remember in our lifetimes is like this. Frieden is now president of Resolve to Save Lives, part of the global organization Fatal Strategies. He says many young people are particularly fearful. I was walking down the street the other day. It was a pleasant day in New York City. And a young woman walked past with gloves and a mask. That's unlikely to be either protective of her or necessary at this time. Other young people don't seem to worry at all. Senior Emily Proctor was in Miami for spring break before the city closed its beaches. She knows she shouldn't have been partying in such large gatherings. And at the end of the day, it does make us feel pretty, pretty guilty. Yeah. But then also, like, we're college seniors and we had one more weekend to enjoy ourselves. And what's going to happen over the next couple of months. And while many older adults are taking precautions, a recent survey by the Kaiser Family Foundation finds many are not. Researcher Mara Ann Brook. Adults who are most likely to be at risk for complications from the coronavirus were no more likely to take precautions than were younger adults and those who are healthy. Momentous swings from great fear to I'm invincible to the sort of business as usual approach has a lot to do with uncertainty. Andrew Maynard with Arizona State University studies how people view risk. The ways we typically deal with risk are to look at what's happened in the past and what we've learned from the past and apply that to the future. But when we've got something happening that we've never experienced before or rarely experienced before, we're basically sort of driving in the dark. When that happens, rather than look at the facts, people often rely on emotions. And in that case, we make mistakes because we base our responses on gut feelings. And if our gut doesn't know anything about coronavirus, the chances are that it's going to be wrong sometimes. In this situation, people typically look at what others are doing and saying. And in that circumstance, it's the loudest voices and the voices that resonate most with our feelings that we pay attention to, or those voices that resonate with the sorts of people that we think are right thinking people that we pay attention to. And the loudest voices, he says, are often the scariest. Psychologist Ellen Peters at the University of Oregon studies how people perceive risk and how it affects their behavior. She says fear can help you prepare, but it can also lead you to do um, some of the hoarding behaviors that people have been going through where toilet paper is missing off of our grocery shelves. At our local Costco, we couldn't get crunchy peanut butter anymore. Equally important in shaping how we view the risk of the virus, Maynard says, is how much it might threaten the people we care about. I've talked to people who have family members or friends that are in vulnerable very concern because they don't want anything bad happening to friends and family and, and loved ones. Also, Maynard says, people who are civic-minded and care about their communities are more likely to take this risk seriously. Patty Newman, NPR News. <laughs> We've been focusing this hour on answering practical questions about the coronavirus outbreak and the new way of life it's created for many Americans. And not to minimize anybody's discomfort, but we think it's fair to say that the last couple of weeks have been especially hectic for parents, juggling school cancellations and new work routines is a lot on its own, not to mention when you're trying to learn as much as you can about the coronavirus. Our next guest, Dr. Cara Natterson, is a pediatrician who spent a good part of her career guiding parents through one of the trickiest times in a child's life, adolescence and puberty, in part because she's the author of the wildly popular best-selling series, The Care and Keeping of You. She makes the point that this has always been a hard time in young people's lives, but in recent years, girls have been given permission to talk about this in a way that boys have not. So that's why she's written her latest book, Decoding Boys, New Science Behind the Subtle Art of Raising Sons. And she's also kindly agreed to lend her medical expertise to some coronavirus-related questions. And she's with us now from her home in Los Angeles. Dr. Anderson, welcome. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. 
So let's talk about your new book. It's called Decoding Boys, uh, New Science Behind a Subtle Art of Raising Sons. You say in, in the book that in, in part because you spent so much time working on uh, on guides for girls and their parents, that boys have really been left out of this conversation. Why is that? I think there's been a tremendous movement over the past couple of decades to find voice for our girls, for our daughters, to help them articulate everything that's happening to their bodies and their social lives and their emotional worlds. But all the while, we have not, as a society, done the same for our boys. And I think part of that is that when boys are in puberty, many of them, many, get when they get quiet, as parents, we expect it, and we sort of go, oh, well, this is what they do, and we leave them to their quiet. And so we have essentially handed girls a microphone to talk about everything that's happening to them while simultaneously giving our boys permission to retreat behind a closed door and assume that he's just going to come out when he's ready and he doesn't want to talk about it. And I think that has left a very large imbalance between the power that girls have to ask questions and to advocate for themselves and the lack of power really that boys have to do the same because they don't build the language. But as you said, this, this book is, has a lot of detail and it covers so many things that parents might be concerned about or might not even have thought about. But can you just name like, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about teenage boys and and what they're experiencing and, and what's some practical advice for parents in addressing it, especially now that we're all sitting a lot more. I think the biggest misconception is that boys don't want to talk. Um, I think they want to talk. I think they don't know they want to talk. Just because they get quiet or monosyllabic or grunty doesn't mean they don't want to engage in the conversation. They just may not know how or they just may be feeding off of the cues they're getting from you because if their first pass response is just a single syllable grunt and then you shut the conversation down, they're not going to engage any further, right? So I, I, think, I think the biggest hurdle for parents to get over is if your son doesn't seem to want to talk about it, okay, go there again. And I'd say that the biggest tip that's repeated over and over, not just in my book, but in parenting books across the board, is there is no such thing as one talk anymore. You know, we used to think the sex talk and it was a singular. This is not reality. Parents are responsible for keeping their kids safe and healthy. This is our job. And in order to do that, we need to have hundreds of conversations with our kids about dozens and dozens of different topics many times over. And you need to do it over the course of several years. So, so that's good advice. Um, it, it isn't one conversation, and, and it, it never was. <laughs> but just to bring yourself up the idea that it's the talk and our talks, which are going to have. So, so the question of safety, perfect segue to the issue that engages, I think, just about everybody right now, which is the whole question of the, the coronavirus outbreak. You are a pediatrician and a parent. Um, I know people always talk for how people should communicate to the kids about what's going on right now. We can break kids into general age group buckets and address what they need to know based upon where they are. Take the extremes. Teenagers, the oldest group of kids, and 20-somethings, who are we still kids? These are individuals who are hungry for good information. Empower them from true information. We should empower them with information. So my advice is to pass along to kids that explain what's going on, let them dive deep into understanding the biology of the virus, understanding concepts like social distancing and hand hygiene. I think one of the frustrations right now with coronavirus is that a lot of young adults are not necessarily socially distancing as, it, as some older adults are. And I think it's because they don't realize the implications of educate all of our kids and young adults. Um, when you go to the youngest group, we don't need to over-inform our youngest kids. The new virus going around, viruses go around the community all the time. You get colds when you go to school or when you get exposed to someone who's sick and those colds are caused by a virus. And you might hear about a new virus going around and it is called 
the coronavirus. Let me teach you how to wash your hands. That's it. The group in the middle is very much for middle schoolers. I love video content. They tend not to be um, voracious readers as much as voracious video watchers. So get them good video content about what's going on around them. Um, and, and then sort of scale down from there if you've got grade school age kids. Get them short form video again. It's just good information. Here and keeping a new series. Her latest book is Coding Boys New Science Behind the Subtle Art of Raising Sons. And it's out now. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much for talking to us. I hope you're happy. Thank you. Thank you. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Penguin Random House. From New York Times bestselling author, James McBride, comes Deacon King Kong, about what happens to the community in the aftermath of an unusual shooting. Deacon King Kong is available wherever books and audiobooks are sold. Doing, even as we self-isolate, is eat and cook. But what to do if you go to the store and the food items you really want aren't there? Last week, we asked David Tamarkin from the cooking website Epicurious for some shopping and meal planning tips for these uncertain times. He had several. Like when you go food shopping, you have a plan so you don't end up panic buying. And some people feel chocolate sandwiches can help people feel better. We thought you might want to hear some more of tips today, starting with this one. Think fresh and get creative. Pasta and frozen vegetables, those things are in short supply at grocery stores right now. But what's interesting is that all the fresh stuff is still there. And what people are not doing is they're not thinking about, oh, if you want to go and get frozen greens, you can get the fresh greens, chop them up, and put them in your freezer. You know what I mean? They're at home. So I think one recommendation I would make to people is the fresh food. There are lots of hearty fresh foods that will last several weeks, like squash and sweet potatoes, onions, apples, carrots will last a long time. Order like things like greens, you can you know and put them either in the freezer or in your over there, they'll last a long while. So I think the pizza dish is tasty and colorful. This is sort of chefy side of me saying this, it's not really important, but it's important to me is if you have herbs, those herbs are going to go really fast. So blitz those herbs in the blender with garlic and olive oil and maybe some chili flakes and some other spices, definitely salt. Make a sauce, make a pesto-ish type sauce, or make a real pesto with some cheese and some nuts. That sauce is going to last you weeks, whereas the herbs are only going to last you two days. And I know that when I'm, you know, self-isolating like right now, I really want that bright green color on my food, and I just want that. Sauces are going to get you that and have access to the fresh herbs that I would normally use. You also suggest stopping up on canned vegetables because you can use them in so many ways. Take canned tomatoes, for example. I prefer those big cans of the whole tomatoes, but if you only have room for a smaller can, so over two. I'm going to make shakshuka with that. You know, that Tunisian tomato peppery stew that you often put eggs into. I'm going to buy, have onions and garlic. I can easily make a shakshuka and slip some eggs into that. If I don't have eggs, it'll be fine. Yeah. But I like the idea of tofu because when I run out of eggs, I'm going to want a sort of creamy-ish protein source. And silk and tofu, it's sort of like an egg if you close your eyes and you don't taste too much. <laughs> Sometimes, though, you might want to make something that just takes a long time to, you know, pass the time. Tamarkin has a suggestion for that, too. If you have not gone into bread making, this could be a very good time to come. It's very distracting. You know, you have to fold that bread every 30 minutes for four hours. So there's no time to get into the news because every 25 minutes. The NPR. Yeah. yeah. And I that? always do. <laughs> that was David Tamarkin of the cooking website Epicurious. And some of his tips for everybody who's spending a lot more time in the kitchen during this crisis. Finally, today we're going to hear some new music from 25 year old Hobson Ari Ruff better known by his stage name, Laos. He's been making music since he was a teenager, but only recently released his first full-length album called How I'm Feeling. And apart from being a fun listen, many of his songs explore themes that many will find relevant in this moment of social distancing and self-isolation. We spoke to Laos before the coronavirus pandemic had eclipsed everything else 
to hear why he chose to focus on some of those things. And now a moment to go. That's right, over the vocal. But such a home, the vocalists found another way to perform. 19 months, many different years in comedy, spread both hope and cheer in this difficult time. We may be physically apart. Countries that are capably dealing with the coronavirus make testing central to their plans. America is woefully behind, and there's now a debate unfolding here at the moment. To test or not to test. Dr. Ashish Jha directs Harvard University Global Health Institute and he joins us now. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Uh, you're pretty clear on this. You say test. Uh, without widespread testing for COVID-19, we're making public health decisions with blindfold, uh, blindfolds, obviously. Um, it's very wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So look, there are people who think testing is not enough, and I agree with that. We need to be doing much more than just testing. Uh, but without testing, we don't know who has it, who doesn't. We don't know who's spreading it. We don't know which communities have high disease burden versus low disease burden. We are blindfolded, and I'd like to take the blindfolds off so we can fight this battle um, with our eyes wide open. But we're hearing state and local gover governments um, saying uh, that we can't test, that so please stay home even if your mouth is sick because you just don't have the capacity. Yeah. That's right. So um, we did yesterday, our best estimate is that we did about 40,000 tests across the country. We should probably be doing two to three times that, not more. Um, so while we're ramping up and making progress, we're still far behind. And so what I'm hearing from doctors and public health officials across the country is that we're still rationing tests and trying to figure out who we can test if we just don't have the test to uh, identify. So tell us where we are with the testing. Um, we're hearing all sorts of different things about new tests that may be coming um, that are quicker, more rapid. Um, that we need to ramp this up. There's a ton of innovation happening. A lot of people are working very, very hard. Um, I think we got slowed down for weeks, actually months, uh, because the federal government didn't take this seriously. And then, remember, three weeks ago, Vice President Pence said there are millions of tests going out. And so I think everybody said, well, the federal government has it. I think we've kind of now come to realize uh, that the federal government isn't going to be the savior here. And so a lot of companies and a lot of labs are, are getting these things going. I'm tracking what's happening on the front line. And what I'm seeing is progress, but we're still far from where we are. I mean, I certainly have people in my circle who have been ill and have been unable to get a test. And I'm sure that you've heard similar stories. And there's an enormous amount of frustration. Yeah, you know, I'm actually, I'm talking to friends, uh, physicians who are, who have sick patients in hospital that they can't get. Uh, or those tests are taking a long time. I do think we're going to be in a better shape in the next seven to ten days. But boy, it's been slow and, and hasn't never been anywhere near where we want to be. Can you please explain why you just said that there has been no leadership on the federal level? Should there have been? Oh my goodness. Um, look, we knew two months ago this pandemic was coming. Everybody knew, the entire public health community knew. The federal government knew that this pandemic was coming. And there has been one mistake after another after another. And then in the last two, four weeks, as, the, as everybody has realized, we're behind the eight ball on testing, um, overly rosy scenarios of millions of tests that's on their way have actually done more harm than good because what they've done is told local labs and state labs, hey, you don't have to work on this because the federal government has it. And I think in the last 10 days, um, people have come to realize um, that if we're going to get testing really wrapped up across the country, uh, local and state officials and, and, and private sectors are going to have to do it. Uh, this is not going to be a federal uh, response. Uh, I just want to ask you in the last minute or so, what do you advise to someone who has symptoms? At this point, should they go and try and get a test or should they stay home? 
I think if you, uh, unless you are very, very sick, uh, unless you're having serious problems with breathing, uh, uh, you really you should contact your doctor. Um, probably do not get hurt. Uh, more readily available, and you should stay away from others. And you should uh, self quarantine. And, and again, most people will get better. Right? Eighty percent of people will not end up needing any serious medical intervention. Um, but obviously, if you get sicker, you have to contact your doctor and you have to go in and get tested and get care of. And will people know when these tests will finally be available? I mean, when will they understand that uh, they can actually be mass testing? Yeah. So again, I'm hopeful that we're days, two weeks away from where we need to be. Well, every day is be better. Um, and I think we just have to keep informing the public of where we are and how far away we are from where we need to be. Dr. Ashish Jha is the director of Harvard University's Low Health Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Turning out of high school seniors, the ones who are bound for college, they're in the throes of picking what school they'll attend next year. As NPR's Alyssa Magnoni reports, the coronavirus is making an already stressful time even more so. This spring was supposed to be an exciting time for Xander. Like many high school seniors, he spent the fall applying to colleges. Like I've researched them, but they're just names and logos and programs. This spring, when we started hearing back from schools, the plan was to visit them. Some of my top choices I've never set foot on campus. I don't know what the campus looks like. But that plan is now out the window. Most colleges have closed their campuses, they've canceled campus tours, accepted student days, and orientation events. Schools are working to migrate those offerings online. But Xander, who lives in Austin, Texas, isn't convinced. <laughs> Plus, there's the issue of money and how his family is going to pay for college. That's going to be even more important now. We're in the midst of a global pandemic, and individual safety and community safety is far more important than where I'm going to go to college. But still, it does add a lot of stress to the process. Maybe I'm going to school out of state, maybe even New York City. Right now, my parents are unsure, especially my mom. She's worried about going to a big city because also that's kind of where the outbreaks happen. And she's worried that if this gets worse or if something like this happens again, where will her daughter be specifically? She has backup schools in Florida where she lives. And like those options are feeling less and less like backup plans. There's never a good time for a pandemic. <laughs> but from an admission standpoint, there really couldn't be a worse time. John Bakken said oversees admissions and financial aid at Oregon State University. Every parent and student's going through a difficult time right now, just managing to deal with uncertainty. March and April are typically when the bulk of acceptances and denial arrive in students' mailboxes and inboxes. Financial aid packages can be this time too, setting up the options for how to pay. The deadline to make the decision has traditionally been May 1st, but schools are rethinking that date. It's really unfair to say, well, we have our deadlines, and come hell or high water, you had better decide by May 1st. I think it's just unconscionable. Having said, an Oregon State helped lead a movement to shift that date back from month to June 1st. So far, about 200 other colleges have committed to that new deadline, and many others are considering it. Marie Bigum runs a nonprofit called Accept, but then tracking schools with a new deposit deadline. She's been urging more schools to join in. I can't fathom any family in six weeks from now saying, I know where my child is going to college where my student is going, and I know I can afford it, and I am confident in the urging admissions offices to be up their online offer, including virtual tools and the ability to sit in on the virtual lecture. She says campus visits have long highlighted inequities, knowing whose students are less likely to travel due to finances. So this is flattening that privilege a little bit. But she says there are still concerns. Going online still ignores the real inequity of broadband of technology, that that is difficult to find in some communities and you know, families can't afford it. And with high schools shut down, it may be harder to stop by a counseling office or get advice from a teacher regarding colleges. So schools are urging students to still reach out to college admissions and financial aid offices on the phone, by email, or on recently developed chat tools. Melissa Madwini, NPR News, Washington. Support for NPR and the following message come from State Farm. 
When it comes to home or auto insurance, State Farm helps you find the right policy to fit your needs. When you're looking for coverage or assistance, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. We're checking now with Francis Swartz. He's mayor of the city of Miami, and he's been posting videos of his experiences with COVID-19. So far, so good. Uh, no major symptoms from last night. I was feeling a little bit of aches and pains. This morning, today is uh, day three since I tested positive for the coronavirus. And Francis Swartz joins us now on the line. Mayor, welcome to the program. Hi, Lucy. How are you? I am well. How are you, Mayor? How are you doing? I actually feel great. I actually feel better. Hopefully now I sort of turn the corner, looking to exiting quarantine, getting very close to the 14th day, which should be uh, early to mid next week. How do you think you became infected? Do you know? We don't know for certain. The presumption that I received a delegation of dignitaries, including the president of Brazil, this is two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. Shook hands with everyone. One of the people in the delegation tested positive. Why do you think the response to this has been so slow? Uh, two weeks ago, you were shaking hands. Um, you were receiving international visitors. You know, I, I'm not sure if I can answer that question totally. I can tell you that you know, we in the city took dramatic action uh, initially. We canceled, we're the first city to cancel a major. Uh, According to some and others, when I was you know, Miami is open for business. And we saw just recently images of some our beaches overrun by spring breakers. Why do you think the governor refused to act and close the beaches? Many have criticized the state responsibly by Governor DeSantis. You know, I can't speak for the governor. I think it's it you. affects you in Miami. Yeah, of course. No, and it, and it does. And, and, and it's affecting me in multiple ways because I don't control the beaches. Since I don't, I'm not the mayor of the city of Miami Beach, I'm the mayor of Miami. Certainly, I've called on the governor and I've called on, on other elected officials and the county officials. And thankfully, they finally did it. And so, we're hoping that with what I requested as a stay at home order, that people start heeding that warning. The spring breakers need to return home. The faster that we come together as a community to the medical professionals, the faster we can go back to normal situation. Well, the problem, as you know, is testing. You are able to be tested, but so many others yeah. have not been. Are you getting enough support at the federal level? Well, yeah, we have not seen, in terms of testing, we have not seen any, at this point, help yet from any of the larger governments. And I think, by the way, it's much more prevalent than what we believe. And it's impossible for me to believe that I'm only the second person that was infected in state county. What grade would you give the federal response then if you haven't seen the aid despite the president's promises that everyone who wants a test can get a test? Well, I think, I don't, I'm not so sure anyone can tell their grades at this point. It's more about us trying to figure out how we can work together to get the resources here, not just in testing, but also the economic anxiety of the state. We work paycheck to paycheck. I was about to ask, how worried are you? Um, the city of Miami encompasses you know, affluent areas like Coconut Grove, which rely on tourism. You also have sizable poor and immigrant communities. What can you do to help them? I'm extremely concerned. Let me tell you, I'm also getting a lot of messages in social media from people that are worried that they're being compelled to go to work when mm -hmm. they don't feel that it's appropriate and they don't feel that the risk is merited. All non-official businesses should be closed in Miami Dade County. All of them. A last question, uh, because you are the mayor of a, of, a, of a city that is affected. How confident are you about the hospital infrastructure? There are already critical shortages in New York, which is being very hard hit, and there's no reason not to believe that that won't happen elsewhere in a city like this. That is the biggest danger. People, you know, some people say, "Look, well, look at you. You know, you're you're, you're asymptomatic. You know, you didn't have to carry." Uh, strong system, and that's true. There are going to be people like me, but there are also going to be a lot of people in Melbourne, people who are compromising immune systems. And so, the concern is about flooding ICUs and about first responders who may not have sufficient medical, you know, personal protective equipment, etc. So, my confidence will be when our residents and if our residents listen to our instructions. That was Francis Suarez, the mayor of the city of Miami. And as far as thank you very much, and I'm glad you're Thank you. So, 
What are we supposed to do if we are showing the symptoms of coronavirus? The advice from healthcare providers is to call first. Don't just show up at a hospital or your doctor. And because of that, we're seeing more virtual evaluations instead of sitting or doing the patients down on the path to determine the Last month, Sarah Debashi traveled to Europe. She returned home to the Philadelphia area on February 23rd. Two days after, on February 25th, I started feeling like sore throat, I had mild cough, and nasal congestion. She was concerned about coronavirus. She called the emergency department at Jefferson Health, and one of the attending doctors recommended an online evaluation using the system's telemedicine program, Jeff Connect. Basically, it's a simple app uh, that we can download and it adds some basic information. Within an hour, she was face to face with a physician using an online platform. Sleeping on FaceTime, there's video and audio. So basically, uh, he started asking questions about my symptoms and also where did I travel. It may not seem as if a doctor could do much virtually, but emergency medicine physician Doug Hollander, who leads Jefferson Health's telemedicine efforts, says you'd be surprised. So if I need to look in your throat, I get the phone physician trying to look in your throat. I can clearly see that you're breathing well or not breathing well. I can see your respiratory. Do you look to be well or look to be sick? In the case of Sarah Debashi, she was able to take her temperature and talk about her symptoms. They were able to rule out coronavirus. The doctors continued to monitor her symptoms and check in with her remotely for several days. Hollander says this is a success story for the patient and for the welfare of the community at large because he says telemedicine may help keep people out of emergency rooms and urgent care during this epidemic. He says, of course, when people need to be seen, say if they're having trouble breathing and the coronavirus is suspected, they'll be directed to come into the emergency department. Because if we know you're coming, at Jefferson, we bring you in through the back door into a biocontainment unit, put a mask on you, and bring you back into your room with the least contact possible. Hollander says more and more people are using the telemedicine program. I mean, our telemedicine volume yesterday alone was double what it was a month ago. Healthcare providers are taking steps to improve access to telemedicine. For instance, Blue Cross and Shield companies say they'll encourage the use of virtual care and try to facilitate access. Sean O'Leary is an infectious disease expert at the University of Colorado. He says many healthcare systems have rolled out telemedicine programs. I think this pandemic is the perfect opportunity to really scale those up because the less we can keep people going into the doctor, the, the less we're going to overburden the healthcare system and the less we're going to spread this virus. Mm -hmm. The fourth guy in here is Allison. Oh, Allison is so interesting. She's now in our studio to talk more about um, what we can all do to help stop the spread. Um, so let's talk more broadly about what's going on with this. The CDC has made this new recommendation about public gatherings. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, yeah. The CDC says that gatherings of 50 or more people should be canceled or postponed for the next eight weeks. So that's through mid May. And in addition to all the announcements from states and cities on restaurant closings, we're not going to hear more advice from the administration about social distancing. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease advisor, said at the weekend, this guidance. That's right. Um, so, lots of people have been asking how to protect the older members right. of their family. What do you tell them? You know, a lot of people don't like to hear this. My own mom didn't want to hear it at first either because it seems so draconian. But given all the evidence that older people are more vulnerable and die from this virus, it is prudent to keep young children away. So, now is a good time if you have children to think of grandparents or elderly family. Come to your home, we don't come to ours, mm -hmm. rarely. Children who get the virus are only likely to have mild symptoms, but none at all, but they could pass it on to another person. I spoke to Sean Morrison, he's a geriatrician at Mount Sinai Health System. This really is a public health crisis that is of a magnitude we haven't seen before. And if we all act as we know we should, we will get through this. So think about FaceTime, maybe a drive visit. You know, remember this isn't forever. So as of today, there are going to be a whole lot of kids off 
from school, at home, my kids include my right. right. job, students do, you know, <laughs> mine as well. So how does social isolation apply? I mean, can we do play dates, Allison? Which well, she says that's for the social distancing may not mean complete isolation. Seriously, and be smart. So you may have heard this six feet, keeping six feet away from others. <laughs> There's no official guidance on play dates. No one is telling you you must cancel the play date. But I think it's pretty interesting. Lindsay Thompson at the University of Florida, I think from her perspective, she'd rather be safe than sorry. I'm personally taking a really strict line. I would say that play dates inherently have a risk. I don't know how big or small, but if we can put off for a few weeks and replace it with a little family time, it would all be better. Huh. All right, so what do we do? Especially because you said we should keep the kids away from. I mean, right. a lot of families rely on right. grandparents but to help them out and not come in to take care of these now, right? So what do we do? Well, you know, this is really hard, and obviously it's going you know, to differ situation by situation. But you know, it can work. Encourage your kids to read. You know, the old fashioned way. Um, a pediatrician told me lots of parents are likely losing experience, and that's just the reality here. I know I will have to. There's lots of these stuff. You can play videos and games online. Right, and here is Allison Aubrey, and she's very important. Allison, we appreciate you for being here, and we have to thank you very much. Part of many people say that it's basically just dating, especially with social distancing, which is so important for other people to stay home. So, what's the best way to start or keep a relationship going? We're trying to stay healthy. We don't even try to date at a time like this. To talk about this, we need to teach people we have to check in to talk about such matters. Susan Petro is a U.S. based today's columnist who writes about manners, among other things. And Lisa Bonos writes about dating and relationships with the Washington Post. Thank you so much for joining us at a distance. I have to say, Hardy, this book to you both. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Time to tell. All right, Steve, but I'll start with you. You're a very social person. I think you've made that clear. How are you coping with social distancing in your relationships? Well, as, uh, as people know, I am a bit bit so I'm out there on, on the market. And um, I think a lot of people are about me for walking safe around the lake, six feet apart. Brother NPR, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. Don't worry, a non communicable bill. Bill Curtis, and here is your host from a jacuzzi filled with hand sanitizer somewhere in Chicago, Peter Sago. Thank you, Bill, and thanks to everyone listening at home. This week, we are going old school. The older members of our audience might remember that for the first seven years of this show, we did it in a studio, the very studio where I now sit, in fact, here at WBEZ in Chicago, where there are panelists connecting to us from their own studios around the country. Now, back then, some people said we were nuts. Why would we do a comedy show hermetically sealed off from any kind of audience? But as it turns out, we were just into social distancing before it was cool. Later on, we're going to be talking to one of the many people on one uh, Stephen Colbert. But now it's time to talk to you. And now to talk is one triple eight. Wait, wait. That's one eight 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 nine two four eight nine two four. Let's welcome our first listener contestant. How are you? Hi. This is Amanda Plummer from Amanda Plummer. Are you? I, yes. Not not that. Not that Amanda Plummer. Okay, I imagine just some hot in your life. In your she daily used to, uh, when I was in college, I was a theater major. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. so Amanda Plummer, of course, is a very well known actress. She was in Pulp Fiction, many other things. She's a Plummer's daughter. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I should ask you what you actually do. Uh, I am a letter carrier. You are a letter carrier. You, my friend, are a hero. You guys are out there in one of the last connections we have to other people. It's great. Thank you for that, doing the work that you do. Great. Well, welcome to the show, Amanda. Let me introduce you to our panel this week. First up, the host of the Daily's podcast, WTL, 
if he's been recording from a tiny room in his house for years, so he's ready for this, and the public radio variety show Livewire, which he will also now be recording from a tiny room in his house. It's Luke Burbank. Hey, Luke. Amanda, I brought my own sound effects. Thank you for your service as a mail carrier. Just imagine lots of people yelling, woo, in such a way it sounds like, boo. Hey, I don't mind this, you know, crowd thing. It's kind of nice, actually. <laughs> Is available anywhere podcasts are found. He's doing Instagram comedy shows nightly to get people through social distancing. It's at Maz Giobrani. It is, yes, you figured it out, Maz Giobrani. Yes. Welcome will be appearing on her website, paulapoundstone.com. Nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. And an autographed toy, it's Paula Poundstone. Hey, man, back. Welcome to the show, Amanda. You're going to play Bill this time. Bill Curtis, sitting right here, is going to read you three quotations from this week's news. If you can correctly identify the story of the shot by a pilot with his flight path this week over Austria. Stay home. Why is the sky telling us to stay home? Coronavirus. Oh, yeah. Amazed that that news got to you. Yes, the coronavirus. Sitting around, staring at your phone has gone from how you procrastinate to how you live. Most employees are now working from home, except of course for you. That's resulted in millions of people downloading photos of tastefully decorated homes from Pinterest, then blowing them up into an enormous poster and hanging it behind them for video meetings. Fashion magazines are running features on what concealer to buy to hide the bags under your eyes when you stipe into from the toilet. This has obviously been a really bad on a lot of levels, but I can say one silver lining for me is for years I have been refusing to throw out the New Yorker. Yeah. My wife, I feel like a New York, a half red New Yorker is like matter. It can't be destroyed. And I am finally having my chance. I pulled out about 120 New Yorkers the other day together and just said, Let's dance October of 2016. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Amanda, everybody, that the federal government is handling this crisis, and I mean that literally, you will be able to know it when it happens, because so far, it's a clown car jacked up on cinder blocks because somebody stole the wheel. The president should never have fired his pandemic team last year and replaced him with a guy who planned the fire festival. 